great to have you with us. Let's do some work in the Bible. Let's do our confession together. I am a child of God. I'm saved by grace. I live each day by faith. I'm ready to hear God's word. I look forward to this lesson today. Please stand as we read together Philippians 2, 14 to 17. Paul says, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights. One translation says stars, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God, just like your faithful service is an offering to God. And I want all of you to share that joy. May God bless the reading of his word, as people said. Amen. Have a seat. Have a seat. Let's dismiss our kids for their lesson. It's good to have Butch Best with us. Good to see you, buddy. Good to see Belva. I'm actually more glad to see Belva than Butch, because I know what she's been through. It's good to see James Daniels. James Daniels made a great trip to Michigan. Great trip up, good time there. His truck died on him in Cincinnati. I told him I know a lot of things that have died on the road in Cincinnati. I grew up there. There's a lot of bad things that happen in that area. I think they, he limped it to Lexington, so he gets to go get his truck. So I guess we need to put his truck on our prayer list, too. James Daniel's truck. Just add that to your prayer list, if you would. Well, there ain't no point shooting it. The sucker's already dead. I mean, once your horse has died shooting, him ain't going to hurt him. He don't care. Mm. Uh, what could we do if we couldn't laugh at each other, huh? It is good to see everybody. Thanks for being here, and, and I just hope God will bless you in the, in the days and weeks ahead. As we, as we do turn the page, on a, as, as was mentioned in our prayer, on a calendar year, uh, just do the best you can with it and make good things happen. I'd like to talk to you a little bit this morning about a lesson called The Star Still Shines. And uh, I'll give you a little background to that in just a minute. But when you think about this, you know, let's go back to the story of the birth of Jesus. And one of the most memorable parts of that story is the star. Because it's just, it's just weird. It's it's It's... It doesn't fit the rest of the story. It just kind of drops in out of nowhere. We remember that when Jesus was born, God created a bright star. Now, we see it nowadays on TV. They have these specials where they're always exploring mysteries of the Bible. Have you ever seen those shows? They're the dumbest shows I've ever seen. Mysteries of the Bible. Where did the star come from? The sky? God, God's a good answer, but I've heard them, you know, where, what was the star? Was it a supernova? And so they've tried to calculate back with supernovas. And all. Was it a comet? Well, it's not one we know of, but there may have been one that came through. Was it an atmospheric, you know, aberration that caused people to see certain things? Is it possible that it was just created by God for the birth of Jesus and was made available for that event. And then, I mean, the God that made all the stars can certainly pop a new one up for a little while and then put it back in the pocket when he gets done with it. It's like somebody says, how did, the, how did, did where, where did the great fish, they've always had theories on what, what was the great fish that swallowed Jonah? What was it? How did he stay alive inside of it? And all that? Who cares? God made a great fish. God's made great fish before. It's not like it's, he's not like an apprentice trying to figure out how to do it. He does this stuff. 
So anyway, we know that God made a bright star. I don't know how it was done. Could he have supernova a star? Yeah. Could he have created a comet to fly through the sky? Yeah. Could he have created his own star? Yeah. Could he have distorted the atmosphere? Sure. All of the above. God can do anything God wants. The point is, the appearance of this star is a, 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 a portent of a, a remarkable event. And it was designed for that purpose. And why, why did God make the star? Just to impress people? Give us something for the, for the Christmas story? No. God created the star to guide people to Jesus. There were certain people... There were certain wise men in the east. These would be called Magi or Magi. And, and they specialized in astrology, astronomy, star studies, that kind of stuff. And somehow they noticed something remarkable and knew enough about the Bible to know that maybe this suggested something remarkable was happening. And so they followed it. And we know a little bit about that story. You can read about it here. Uh, Matthew reminds us, he says, Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea during the reign of King Herod. And about that time, some wise men from the eastern lands arrived in Jerusalem saying, where's the newborn king of the Jews? We saw his star as it arose, and we have come to worship him. So these guys show up. Now, in between here and there, verse 9, is a little discussion between them and Herod because Herod wants to know where he is too so he can take him out. So they have this little conversation and then they, he says, now when you find him, you be sure and let me know so I can come worship him. Yeah, right. So anyway, verse 9 picks up the story and says, after this interview, the wise men went their way and the star they had seen in the east guided them to Bethlehem. It went ahead of them and stopped over the place where the child was. That tells me it's not an ordinary astronomical phenomenon it says it, it it led them along the way and stopped over the place where Jesus was born now even comets aren't that talented so this tells me this is a purely supernatural event uh, when they saw the star they were filled with joy they entered the house saw the child bowed down and worshiped him and then opened their treasure chests and gave him the the precious gifts of the Far East. So, so this story confirms to us that God created this star as a guiding star. It literally, it literally almost led them by the nose right to the place where Jesus was. Several years ago, uh, one of my favorite country groups, Diamond Rio, uh, put out a Christmas album. Beautiful Christmas album. I'd recommend it. And the album's title was also the, the number one song on the album. And the song was called The Star Still Shines. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful song. I'd sing it to you, but it's too beautiful to butcher up like that. So, but the idea behind the song is as long as people are healed, as long as people are made whole, as long as the lost are saved, as long as the church survives... As long as God's people continue to be God's people, the star keeps shining. Because the star is to guide people to Jesus, and, and that still goes on. In fact, the Apostle Paul later reminds us that we are supposed to continue that work. Okay? What does he say in Philippians 2? He says, do everything without complaining and arguing so that no one can criticize you. Now listen to this next verse. Live clean, innocent lives as children of God. Why? So you can shine like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. Why would you want to do that? So they can see what's going on and find Jesus. He says live like Jesus so people can follow you to him. We are. We are the shining stars that continue to shine in the world today. And as long as there's one Christian submitted to Jesus and living the Christian life and sharing the Christian message, that star's going to continue to shine. And that's, that's kind of the idea. I want to play with that idea. I like their idea musically. I, think, I thought to myself, this will preach. 
preachers are always looking for another sermon idea, so I thought this was a good one. Let's play around with this just a little bit. For instance, I want to make two points here. First of all, the star still shines when Christians act like Jesus. Now, I stress that we don't always do that, do we? We were talking today in class about anger. Well, you can be angry like Jesus. Or you can be angry not like Jesus. And when, I, when my selfish anger takes over, instead of my righteous anger, when my selfish anger rules my life, I'm not shining. I'm not, I'm not giving off the kind of glow that people can follow to the, to, to the Savior. When I lie, when I'm dishonest, when I'm deceitful, when I'm self-centered, those kind of things don't point people to Jesus. They don't look at me and say, boy, I want to be like him. They, they look at you and they say, <laughs> they look at their kids and say, don't ever act like that guy. You know, if you're acting in a way where a parent's going to say to their kid, don't be like him, then you don't be like him. Okay? That's just not a good thing. What are we supposed to do to act like Jesus? Well, one of the things the Bible says, and I've tried to find passages where it actually says like, kind of like Jesus or something like that. The Bible says that as Christians, our job is to love and support one another. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There are a lot of people that call themselves Christians that don't do that. They don't, they don't lend their physical support by being present. They don't give any encouragement. In fact, there are, there are Christians who, who criticize and complain and constantly judge everything everybody does. There are some Christians that think God appointed them to judge the world. Guess what? He already applied for and accepted that job. So I don't have to worry about that. Paul even says on one occasion, I don't judge outsiders. Why? Why? Because the Word of God's already judged them. They live under judgment. Our job is simply to show them Jesus. 1 John 2, look at verses 7 and 8. Paul says, dear friends, I'm not writing a new commandment to you. Rather, it's an old one you had from the very beginning. Now, in John's way of thinking, the very beginning is when Jesus came to this earth. That's his concept of the very beginning. This old commandment to love one another. By the way, did you know how old that is? That goes clear back to the law of Moses on Mount Sinai. Did you know that? When that man asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, and he says, well, there's two. The first one is you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He quoted right out of the Old Testament law of Moses. And then he says, and the second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbors yourself. Quoted right out of the book of Leviticus. God's always had those two laws there. Love me with everything you've got. Love your neighbor like you'd love yourself. Jesus says you've heard it before, yet it is also new. Why is it new? Because Jesus put an exclamation point on it at the cross. He made it the foundation of his whole kingdom of God on this earth. He says this is what I want you to do. Jesus lived the truth of this commandment. I like that statement. It doesn't say Jesus taught this. It says Jesus lived it. That's powerful. And you also are living it. For the darkness is disappearing and the true light is already shining. As long as Christians act in love and support of each other the way Christ has shown us to do it, the star is going to keep shining. Because we are modeling him to those around us. And people won't understand that. You mean you can go to church and tell people you made a mistake and they're not going to run down on you about it? No, no, no. You mean you can show up at church in a plain old shirt and a pair of blue jeans and they won't offer to buy you a suit so you can worship God like you're supposed to? No, we don't play those games. We don't play those games. I don't think Jesus ever wore a tie. You like my new tie? It's nice, isn't it? Cedric, they had a deal going on at Penny's. Buy a shirt, get one free. Buy a tie, get one free. I went crazy. 
Hey, take you up there this afternoon, okay? Yeah, buddy. Merry, Merry Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is nice, and I, I like to wear it. It looks nice, but it, it's not what being a Christian's about. It's really not what being a Christian's about. And so if we stay true to the message and true to the man, then the light shines. When we proclaim the truth in love, the star shines. Now notice there's three words there, truth in love. It doesn't say truth with a snotty attitude. It doesn't say truth in self-righteous judgment. It doesn't say truth in arrogance. It says proclaiming the truth in love. Now let me stress this. It does say we're to proclaim the truth. It doesn't say that if you love people, then the truth doesn't matter. Now wait just a minute. We're going in the wrong. That's just as wrong as doing the other. Do we need to follow the truth? Yes. Do we need to go to the book and get the truth? Yes, we do. Do we need to proclaim the truth in action and in words? Yes. But there are different ways to do that. And what he's talking about is how it's done. Ephesians 4. Paul says this. Then we will no longer be, he's talking about growing into maturity. He says, then we won't any longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we, notice the we, who's he talking about? He's talking about us, isn't he? Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, listen to this, more and more like Christ. So, I guess Jesus must have done that, huh? More and more like Christ, who is the head of the body of the church. Our goal is simply to do what the brain's telling us. The brain says, preach the truth. The brain says, preach it in love. If we do either one of those in a way other than the way the brain says, we're not obeying the head of the body. We're not submitting. We're not being like Jesus. And so, again, that comes up. The third thing I want you to think about as far as the way we live our lives is we're supposed to be forgiving. By the way, that includes at home. Teenagers, it includes school. Yeah. Yeah. It includes the ball field. It takes in the office. It includes the car line at, 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 uh, at, at McDonald's. It includes driving through Cookville on Friday night and Saturday. <laughs> All that stuff, man. You got to be forgiving. You know how you learn to be forgiving? The way you learn forgiveness is to learn how to get out of yourself. If you ever learn to get outside of yourself, then forgiving becomes quite easy. It's hard to forgive people when you're all wrapped up in you. Because they might not be what you think they ought to be. And they might not do what you want them to do. And they might not live up to what you think they should be. Who cares? They did a scientific study several years ago. NASA did. They've been putting all these... these uh, uh, things out in space to analyze the universe you know what they found out they have found out that the world the earth as we know it revolves around the sun and not around you I know that may be a shocking scientific fact for many of us but it's true the world does not revolve around you or me or anybody else we're simply little pieces of the of the whole thing and so, you know, the, the sooner I figure that out and get over me, the sooner I get a handle on forgiveness. And, Richard, the sooner I get a handle on anger. Anger is a selfish sin. Anger is all about me. The things that make me angry are the things I don't like or I think I should get or that I feel like I deserve. If I can just get me out of the way, the world gets to be a better place. We need to learn forgiveness. Listen to this. 
He shows you the eye-centered stuff in verse 31, and then he shows you what God wants in 32. And notice the word at verse 32, again, it says, instead. We're doing contrast here, right? Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger. There it is. Harsh words and slander. Slander is language intended to hurt or damage. As well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. And again, that example comes up. Forgiving one another how? Just as God through Christ has forgiven you. In other words, give what you got. If you got it. You know why I think a lot of Christians have trouble with this? Is because they never have really felt the sense of being forgiven by grace. We don't have a sense of being saved by grace. We don't have a sense of being forgiven by God. Especially those of us, I'm going to be honest. Especially those of us who grew up in the church all our lives. Why, we're not sinners. We've been in the door every day, every night, every Wednesday, every Sunday morning, all times days of gospel meeting. How many of you grew up in a home where if you'd have even suggested not going out to church, you'd have got beat within an inch of your life? Yeah, yeah. God bless godly parents. Because there's times in my life when that kind of training kept me where I should be. But you do figure it out after a while, don't you? That there's, there's a bigger there's a bigger picture than that involved. My, my. That God in Christ has forgiven you. That's how you learn forgiveness, is you realize what God's done for you. You realize that in the story of the two debtors where the guy owns the, 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 owes the master $3 million and the friend owes him $25? I figured out a long time ago, I'm the $3 million guy. There's not a one of us in that story that's the 25 buck guy. We're the $3 million people. And so once you get that figured out, you're up and running. So when we do those three things, when we, when we learn to act like a Christian ought to act and model life the way we can, the, the star is going to shine. People are going to see that. People inside the building here are going to see that. And it encourages them and moves them in the right direction. The other thing about the star that keeps shining is as long as we point others to Jesus, isn't that what the star was for? And by the way, all that behavior stuff, that's what that's designed for. God doesn't want us to behave in those good ways, in those positive, kind, loving, forgiving ways, because he just likes to, you know, get in your grill and torque your life up and make it hard for you. He does it because those kind of behaviors model the God that gave us Jesus. And, and they model the Jesus that was born at Bethlehem. Our goal is to become like Christ, who was and is like God the Father. It all connects. If I act in a way that's, that's, that's a disconnect from Jesus, I'm not pointing anybody to Jesus. In fact, how many folks do we all know who have been turned off from Jesus by some knuckleheaded Christian who knew everything in the world in the Bible except how to act like a Christian. If you'd have given them a doctrinal questionnaire, they'd have got 100%. You give them a behavioral questionnaire, they get zero. Or maybe 10%. Let's be generous and forgiving. As God in Christ has forgiven us. Eh, you got to give people a little bit of a break. But that's about the truth, isn't it? And it's not either or. People say, well, if you're loving and kind, then you just don't hold people to the truth. Really? Would you like to tell Jesus that? Yeah, you might get some fire from heaven called down on you. Well, he wouldn't do that either. He'd forgive you. God forgives knuckleheads, you know that? Yeah, he's good at it. Aren't you glad? You knucklehead, you. <laughs> you can't even get your truck home. I mean... <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I dropped the transmission all the way across the bridge in Memphis once. One piece at a time. The seal started over here and the rest of the parts just came out. Oh, 
the way. I st- I, they may still be there. I don't know. It's a good car, too. Let me tell you how you can bring others to Jesus. It's real simple. You don't have to have an evangelistic program. You don't have to sit in a class on evangelism. You don't have to start a bus ministry. You don't have to do pamphlets. You don't have to do home Bible studies or any of that. Here's how you win people to Jesus. Now, you do have to mention him to them every now and then. But here's how you win people to Jesus. Number one, our good works should guide others. Shouldn't they? What we did for the kids over here in, uh, in, in Doyle. Somebody says, well, we didn't have many parents here. I don't care. There are kids that are going to school over there right now that will remember that day that they spent here at church. And they'll remember about those nice church people that gave us so much time and and gave me a couple of things I'd not had any Christmas if they hadn't given me something. Isn't that great? There are people in India that are going to church in church buildings that have our name on it. That's not so that we get credit. It's because they know that there are people somewhere they'll never see, never meet, who are big, fat, rich people who have money coming out of their ears. Hey, you ever, you ever been to India? I haven't, but we're big, fat, rich people. Trust me. We got so much money, we don't know what to do with it. We can chump change $5,000 and build them a building. They couldn't build a building in 50 years of giving everything they had. Those are good works. Jesus himself says this. He says, you... He's talking to us. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket. Here's that word again. Instead, instead what? A lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. Now, what's the point? Well, in this case, he actually tells us the point, doesn't he? He says, in the same way, You let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You mean we should let people know what we're doing? Absolutely. The key is not letting people know what you're doing. It's who you give the credit to. Okay? If we secretly, quietly slink around doing good deeds in the name of Jesus, ain't nobody ever going to learn about Jesus. So when you send a bag of food to a kid, stick a little card in there that says, from your loving friends at the Cumberland Heights Church of Christ. And you don't put after that because we're the most wonderful people in the world and you'll never meet anybody like us again. Or maybe a card that says, Jesus loves you with all his heart. Your friends at the Cumberland Heights Church. What a revolutionary, creative, amazing idea. I talk with my son David a lot about, he works with a radio station. He says, hey, everything in life is about branding. You brand yourself. All of us do. We call it reputation, street cred, whatever you want to call it. All of us are branded, right? We all are known for certain things. We all are associated with certain things. When I go to high school reunion, which I avoid like the plague, they always remind me of the time when me and some guys dropped a kid into the bushes out the second floor window. That's how I was branded. Now, I was just doing what I was told. We were holding him out the window, and he was screaming. The teacher came in and said, let that boy go, and we did. (laughs) Obedient to the last. I obeyed her all the way to the principal's office. Where I then was branded, C-H-S. He had it drilled into the paddle so that when he hit you with it, it actually spelled the initials of the school. I thought that was creative. So anyway, we all are branded. Now, if you can be branded, if you can brand yourself with Jesus, then that's what it's all about. Let your good deeds shine before men. Notice the word shine. The star. Your godly life should influence others. People should know if they want an honest opinion, come to her. If you want to know the truth, go to him. If you want want a, a, a fair business deal, trade with those folks. They're honest as the day is long, 
they're, they're decent, they're kind, they're, they're just, they treat people right. And always have and always will. Hey, if he said it, it's true. Because if it wasn't, he wouldn't say it. Yeah. Our lives ought to make that statement. I love 1 Peter 2. Peter, by the way, the whole theme of the book of 1 Peter is we are living as outsiders in this world. You know the song we sing, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through? Yeah. That is the theme of 1 Peter. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And he says, always keep that in mind when you live your life. And this is how he puts it. Dear friends, I warn you, I love this, as temporary residents and foreigners, as temporary residents and foreigners, to keep away from worldly desires that wage war against your very souls, and then listen to this, be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Why? Because then, even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they'll see your honorable behavior, and they'll give honor to God. Yeah. You know, one of the things the writer of Hebrews mentions about Jesus is he, he overcame the world by the power of what he calls an indestructible life. Elders are supposed to be men who are above reproach. What does that mean? That means they've got good branding, right? <laughs> they shouldn't have a lot of bad street cred. I went to a church one time years ago growing up as a kid where one of our elders was known in town in his business dealings as the biggest crook in town. Now what's wrong with that picture? Stinks, doesn't it? Yeah. Jesus says through Peter, be careful how you live in front of others. They're judging you whether anybody else does or not. Even if we don't judge you in the church, the people in the world are, hey, listen, they're tougher on us than anybody. Because they're living. It's just like Coach Saban at Alabama. He can't say anything right if you're from anywhere but Alabama, right? No matter what he says, he's going to be criticized for it. Why? Because he's from Alabama. Well, how come everybody wants his coaches? How come everybody wants to run their program like his? Well, he must be doing something right. But he doesn't say anything right, does he? He's a bad person. Now, that's the way the world is toward Christians. We've got a winning program here. We've got a winning team. We've had undefeated seasons year after year after year. And by the way, Revelation tells us we're already going to win the national championship. It's a done deal. And the world doesn't want to hear that. So what are they going to do? Anything the coach says? Anything any of the players do, it's going to be magnified, isn't it? People love it when a winning team has a player that messes up and does something he shouldn't. You can have 100 players do the same thing around the country, and this kid will get front page news because he's the starting linebacker at Ohio State or at Michigan or at, at Alabama or at USC. That'll be front page news. There might be 25 other kids that get arrested for the same drunk driving charge that night. You won't hear about any of them. Why? It's human nature. Folks, we've got to be careful how we live. Got to be right. The other thing we focus on as Christians is gracious words. Our words ought to lead people. I mean, people can't know about Jesus if you don't tell them. People don't just intuitively figure out about Jesus and the cross. I've got news for you. Paul says nobody can, can come to faith without being taught. It's got to happen. So at some point, we've got to open the book and show them some things. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians. He says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful. Now, that one stops you in your tracks right there. All of us just fell under condemnation from God right there. And you don't even have to cuss and stuff to do that. Just passing on something that's not true. It's not good and helpful. Yeah. So that your words will be an encouragement to those that hear them. Always think about when you're around your, your non-Christian friends, your unbelieving friends. Are you encouraging them? And you don't have to preach Jesus all the time. You, know, you, you ever been to work with somebody who just preaches about Jesus all the time? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Jesus this and Jesus that. And you know what? 
And I'm a Christian. I'm a man. I'm a minister of the gospel. And there's times when I just want to slap him in the mouth and say, would you shut up? I mean, please. Give it a break. Give it a rest. You know, I don't need it and they don't want to hear it. But you can also drop those seeds. You know, you put a seed in the right ground at the right time and nurture it just a little bit and it produces fruit. You've got to know how to do that. Let me give you three things worth remembering real quick. Number one, Jesus continues to live today through his church. That's the whole point of the book of Acts. The whole point of the book of Acts is, he says, look at Luke. This is the way Jesus lived. Look at Acts. This is the way we have continued to live just the way he lived back here. If he did this, we do this. If he said this, we say that. If he treated people this way, we treat people this way. You know. Luke is Jesus 1, Acts is Jesus 2. And so we need to realize we are the embodiment of Jesus in the world today. They are going to judge the Jesus of history by the church of today. Fact of life. Number two, people today still need to be guided to Jesus. Boy, maybe more than ever. Boy, you talk about people wandering around. Talk about the blind leading the blind. You ever listen to some of these advice shows on TV? And I'm thinking, here's one idiot telling another idiot how not to be an idiot. I don't get this. You know? That's like I tell our teenagers. And you guys have heard me say this, haven't you? Don't ask your friends for advice because they're as dumb as you are. I mean, I didn't grow up with a single teenager in my life that wasn't an idiot. All of them were. Some of them still are. <laughs> I won't say who, and it might reflect badly on me. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? You don't ask somebody who doesn't know anything about it to tell you about it. Don't ask a guy that's never laid a floor how to lay a floor. He goes home, watches the video, and then comes back. He's an expert on how to lay a floor. Not a good idea. So we need to realize that our world is incredibly misguided. And by the way, let me, let, me, let me dispel a myth here. We don't live in a Christian nation. I don't know where we ever came up with that idea. We do not live in a Christian nation. We live in what may be the most worldly secular culture that's ever been created. We live in an incredibly self-centered, evil ungodly culture and if you don't you know christian folks nowadays well most folks claim to be christian you can claim to be anything i can claim my car's a mercedes-benz but it ain't okay even if i put a mercedes sticker on it even if i take it once a week on sunday morning and park it in the mercedes lot it's still not a mercedes And I thank the Lord every day when I go and get an oil change that it's not. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> or have brakes done on it. That'll be $8,400. What? My car didn't cost that much. We need to realize that we live in a hostile environment, that the world outside of this door is a minefield. And you've got to walk carefully. Last point. Christians today are the shining cho stars chosen by God. To lead the world to Christ. God wants them. They need him. We're the connector. We're the, we're, the, we're the cog in the machine that connects everything together. Okay? We're the, we're the broadcast unit. God can prepare a, a production and send it to the broadcast unit. And you can have a thing here that could project it. And it's already here. But if there's a disconnect between the one and the other. Message never gets through. We're the place. We're the only place on earth where the disconnect can take place. We're also, by the same token, the only place on earth where the connect can take place. It's up to us. It's on us. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Glorify your Father in heaven. As you start a new year, let me encourage you to ramp up the wattage a little bit. Okay? 
Switch from standard lighting to LED. It's brighter. And it uses less energy. Hmm? Best of both worlds. You ever see these guys on these cars nowadays that have these headlights that go, you know, you're driving down the road and they turn, they come around the curve and it goes, wow, right in your face. And it's like, oh. And, you know, for the next three miles, you don't see anything. Just little white dots in front of your eyes. You just hope something doesn't pull in front of you because if you do, it's gone. Now, God doesn't say that we have to be that kind of light. But God says that if you're a Christian and somebody turns the light on in the room, they ought to be able to see through you. They ought to be able to see that in the other corner over there, Jesus is sitting. Let's be some shining stars this year. Let's make this next year, if you're going to make a resolution of any kind, make it a year of being a shining star for Jesus. Let the star continue to shine as God intends it to be. If you're not a Christian, well, one of the things that a light has to have to work is it has to be plugged in. And if you're not a Christian, you're not. I don't mean that unkindly, but it's true. Jesus puts it this way. I'm the vine and you're the branch. Any branch that does not produce fruit is cut off and thrown away. Why? Because it's sec effectively it's disconnected. You need to connect. If you're not a Christian, let me encourage you. Let me, let me urge you this morning to put your faith in Jesus, to put your words in Jesus. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. To put your actions in Jesus. And I'm willing to be baptized into Christ, to be washed of my sins and raised to walk a new life as one of God's children. If you haven't done that, why not today? If you're a Christian let me encourage you again, turn up the wattage just a little bit. Shine a little brighter, be a little straighter, be a little bit more faithful, and keep the star shining for Jesus. While we stand and sing.